it is well worth investing in a sangha. If you sow seeds in arid land, few seeds will sprout. But if you select a fertile field and invest your wonderful seeds in it, the harvest will be bountiful. Building a sangha, supporting a sangha, being with a sangha, receiving the support and guidance of a sangha is the practice. We have individualized and sanghaized. When a sangha shines its light on our personal views, we see more clearly. In the sangha, we won't fall into negative habit patterns. Stick to your sangha. Take refuge in the sangha. And you will have the wisdom and support you need. Thank you, Thich Nhat Hanh, for those words. And thank all of you for being here today. Okay. Well, I hope it's in the sangha. <laughs> And this is a beautiful, up here, a beautiful spring day on the Central Coast. Hard to imagine that last Monday I was in Troy, Ohio, walking in the snow. That's just amazing. The tulips, all these uh, spring flowers coming up, and everything else in the snow. It's really beautiful. Those we always do, our custom to remember our Native American heritage, so I ask you to put your palms together with me as we remember the Native Americans who walked these lands for thousands of years before us. In all honesty, it was our own American genocide. And here in our local area, it's the Northern Chumash Yaki Kusu Yakani. So I would like to acknowledge and pay my deep respects to the Chumash people and elders and ancestors, past, present, and future. They walked these lands and took care, lived in harmony with nature. And during the course of this talk, you'll hear me use the word harmony a number of times. So may we learn from them. Most of us are quite familiar with this idea, or this word, Sangha. It's, of course, one of the three treasures, the others being the Buddha and the Dharma. Also called the three jewels, or triple gem. And we take refuge in I would like actually to do probably a series, another couple of talks on the three jewels, the three treasures. This was actually sparked, this talk, because I needed to do a, or was asked to do an article in Waterworks about UCLA. And initially it was just going to be a little compressed thing, kind of talking a little bit about our song out here. And then uh, Ascension, Sensei Ascension wanted to expand it to. Uh, talk more, get some more Dharma points along with it. And uh, so I wrote the Dharma talk, and then I had to condense it to the 1,500 word maximum. <laughs> so that was a chore, yeah, editing all of this. In Mahayana Buddhism, we look at these three treasures from three perspectives. The historical Buddha, his teaching and the historical disciples that lived in his day and his lay students and followers are called the Yenzen Sanbo. And Sanbo is a treasure. And we call them the manifest of three treasures. The maintained three treasures, or Juji Sanbo, are the Buddha images that represent the Buddha, the printed texts sutras, and the Sangha members in all the Buddhist Sanghas. And finally, the Absolute, the Thai Sangha, 
which is the, the one vital three treasures. Seamless, everything is connected. Shohaku Okamura said, uh, Sangha treasure is the interconnection of all beings within the endless net of the universe. So let's explore this a little bit, a little bit more. There are many definitions out there. I think I went to four sources. And of course, it's a, a Sanskrit word that uh, some say literally means crowd or host. The Princeton Dictionary of Buddhism, using the word Sangha, S-A-M-G-H-A, says it's generally translated as order or community. And it is, um, they say, the term literally means that which is struck together well. That which is struck together well. Suggesting something that is solid and not easily broken apart. I like to I love the word uh, beloved community, and many of us uh, remember that from John Lewis, a politician and civil rights activist who served in the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, it was Georgia's fifth congressional district. He was there for many years. And he used that word, uh, his belief in the beloved community. And this was a society based on the idea of trying to achieve the kingdom of God on earth. And I like to look at it from a Buddhist perspective, that for Sangha, trying to achieve the Buddhist ideal here on earth. So to kind of summarize that, we have different ways of looking at the Sangha. And in one sense, of course, it is the historical followers of the Buddha. And it can also be expanded to all Buddhist Sanghas, the monastic community, the monks, nuns, and novices. In a wider sense, it includes lay people in the Sangha. And expanded even further as suggested by the absolute three treasures, it includes all sentient beings. So I've had the opportunity here over the last 20, 22 years to witness the burden of the Sangha. That's our little Sangha here. And the maturing of the Sangha down at the Zen Center in Los Angeles. And it's been really a, a fascinating journey to be involved in the program. So the idea for our little group here actually came up. I was sitting about almost 20 years ago now at the Sangha House in, uh, at UCLA, and I was having lunch with Sensei Dokai. And Dokai had suggested, uh, why don't you think about starting sitting with I said, what? Me? I'm pretty new in the practice. At that time, I had not even received Jukai. So she said, well, sit with me. I did. And see who's home. One thing led to another, and Roshi suggested that I meet with Sensei Shingetsu, who had a group in the uh, San Fernando Valley. Valley Sangha, and to connect with her and get some advice from her. I did. And I'll never forget that meeting. She was so encouraging and so informative. And she said, consider it as a gift of the Dharma for all of us. So I was pretty insecure. Moved ahead. We gathered some folks. Mainly, there were a few interested students in one of my yoga classes and friends from the White Hair Summit, which is where we're sitting today, that I had known for a number of years, most of those through the yoga class. And we started meeting 
in an optometrist's office in downtown San Luis Obispo. Uh, Ron Schwartz. So that was interesting. Uh, we sat in the reception area of his office, and the Kim Hing cat went down the hallway past the exam rooms and uh, back through his eyeglass display area. <laughs> that said, if you would open the back doors and you could hear the San Luis Obispo Creek, you could hear the soothing sounds of the San Luis Obispo Creek, which were right outside down the one of his office. So in those early days, we did two periods of sitting, and then we would kind of hang out and either be discussed discuss a book or have some kind of discussion. And as the years passed, our little group moved a few times. At one point, we were at uh, Peter Stereos, Stereos uh, Yoga Center, again in downtown San Francisco. And at another time, for about a few years, we were housed at the Yoga Dome of the Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort in Al down by Alpha. Eventually, we found our way to the current location, Burroughs Inn. And it, Mary Bernard is the owner, and she graciously has allowed us to stay here for many, many years now. And on her own website, it says it's a secluded six acre property nestled in an oak canopy forest in the quiet hills of Squire King. Perfect. And now we get to listen to. The uh, crickets chirping in the summer, and after a rain, we get to hear the frogs. Sometimes those frogs, down by what I call the, the Thoreau cabin, the old pond, uh, it's venom. It, I've recorded some of them. You, you, it's just amazing. So throughout these formative years, I continued my own studies with Roshi Yoko. Down, spending most of my weekends down in Los Angeles at UCLA. And as I grew in the practice, eventually ordained at priest in 2012, I started adding little things to the group up here. Um, we started small service, short service, evenings of reflection, um, practice talks. We did super talking. I remember doing that. that we need to do that again. Uh, atonement ceremonies, the Venkais, so doing a few of those. And then we added annual services, just as we do down at UCLA. Buddha's birthday here in Nirvana, Bodhi Day, year end services. And a number of us who, throughout all this time, started making trips, road trips, down to Sashims at UCLA and to the Prince. At some point, there was an interest by a number of the members to take a preset. So classes were taught, and my wife, Carla, uh, volunteered and, you know, to uh, guide the Vatsu self. And we had our first Jitai ceremony here in this building, right here, in 2017. Six members received presets. So that seed that had been planted so many years ago had blossomed. We we officially we officially became a Zen Sama. And I was told in my uncertain terms by Oshi Yoko, you need three people that have taken the precept to be considered a Zen Sama. We uh, actually added a Tuesday morning sip at a Rinpai, one of our members, at his Aikido dojo in San Francisco. And uh, Koshin, Kanjo were often there with me, and I can remember being in that dojo <laughs> at six in the morning, sitting and we could see over us. It was so cool. Very on um, It was good. Um, then finally, we secured the Sunday venue here at the White Mountain Summit. 
And uh, I received transmission in December 2019. So the week following the COVID shutdown, the state of Florida, Florida, we actually had all of our programs up and running on Zoom. Because ECLA did pretty much the same. And as a result of the opportunity of Zoom, dealing with Zoom, we actually added our offerings. So we expanded our programs. Then we invited uh, ZCLA SONGA members to join us on Sunday Zoom here. And I know we've been to them and done that, or did that for about two years, almost two years. And I think it was, I'm not 100% sure, but I think in the fall of 2020, we began meeting again in person, masked, as we do as we are today, and taking proper precautions. Only those that were fully vaccinated were supposed to attend, and others were required to attend on their own Zoom. And of course, we continued to offer the Zoom participation. In November of 2021, in this hybrid environment, we had our first person, and it's Kanjo, finished his year as head trainer. Again, right here in this room. And we're looking forward to that again. Uh, next year, as Runtai, or at the end of this year, as Runtai finishes his year as head trainer. So, I have to admit that over the years, at times, I get pretty discouraged. The song is so small, we haven't seen much growth. And this has been, we started the day, it's sitting here, it's been almost 20 years now. I've been at UCLA for 22 years. So, at times, my ego gets a bit. I'm wishing for a larger sangha. I'm wishing for uh, a brick and mortar facility of our own. And coupled with that is I get kind of frustrated. It's schlucking the Zendo and the Buddha Hall here uh, twice a week to a venue so we go to. I load and unload the car at what I lovingly refer to as the Los Rotos Hermitage where Carl and I live. And um, often the setup at Pro's End is done, uh, I'm either on my own or there's just maybe one or two conjo offerings on each day, or once a week day, actually, last, uh, last week. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, not, it's a lot of work. So I pause. And I look at Dovin. And Dovin spoke to the inner attitude that we should maintain in this process. He said, when we make a vow to found a temple, sangha, or monastery, we should not be motivated by human sentiment, but we should strengthen our aspiration for the continuous practice of the Buddha Dharma. Shohaku Roshi, Shohaku Okamura, you may be some reading his translation of the commentary on the end of the call. He said, we don't need lofty temple buildings for our practice. We don't need a formal zazen hall. When we vow to establish a dojo, monastery, or sangha, we should not forget this. The number of buildings or people is not essential. The critical points are practice and aspiration. And what, when I was preparing the talk, what came up for me often was the piece from Dogen Zenji from uh, the Monkey uh, out of the Shogunzo that we read on the formal tea before Dharma Compact. And we read this uh, on that occasion uh, every year. 
And he said, and this is, uh, he's speaking to uh, injure his, his uh, he had given dark information to him. And this was his first time doing it like this. And so he says, don't let the smallness of this assembly or the fact that this is his first lecture bother you. The group around Ben Yang, another uh, teacher, amounted to only six or seven persons. Yao Shen had less than ten disciples at the beginning. Yet they all practiced the way of the Buddhas and the patriarchs. At times like this, they say, at a time like this, they say, is when a monastery is back to its issues. So I remember what Sensei Shingetsu, Shingetsu had told me all those years ago that this was an offering of the God. And now as, as a teacher, it's definitely in keeping with my own morality. One of my uh, mentors for prison work, many of you know, uh, many of you don't, uh, Master Nagasita Butler, He told me repeatedly, Shogun, just show up. And that's what I do. And realizing that all the time and effort in this is for the God. And the tedious setting up and tearing down that happens every week, I actually figured that I've, been, I've incorporated it into my personal physical exercise program. And on meeting days, I routinely get far more than 10,000 steps. <laughs> so Thich Nhat Hanh, in Katie's words that I opened the talk with, perhaps sounds a little flowery and idealistic. He also wrote about Sangha. Sangha is the beautiful community that practices joy, realizing liberation, bringing peace and happiness to life. And his own translation of the three jewels that I, I did in the posting last night or this morning, his translation uh, says, I take refuge in the Sangha, the community that lives in harmony and lives. From our evening of reflection, when we chant, when we, uh, when we make, do the chanting for the evening, we say, I take refuge in the Sangha, I vow to your body of harmony, the interdependence of all creations. Then in our atonement ceremony, there's a line, being one with the Sangha, let harmony pervade everything. Is there always harmony in the sangha? No. And this was true even in Shakyamuni Buddha's day. And they, in fact, went through two pretty famous schisms at the time of the Buddha the Devadatta schism and the Kosanga schism. So, Devadatta was a Buddhist monk who joined, I think, after Buddha had been teaching about 15 years. And he sought to reform the song because he wanted to impose an even stricter code of, of life. He was the cousin of the Buddha. So he tried to take over the Sangha and at a formal meeting proposed that Buddha retire and stop teaching. Well, the proposal was rejected. Now, as he was trying to orchestrate these things, David Daga had in, instigated the crown prince of the Ugata to actually kill the crown prince's father, his own father. And he did. And that was then the Sarah became Along with that, or coupled with that, it said that Devadatta also made three abortive attempts to bring about Buddha's death. He 
hired assassin. He tried one time rolling a rock off the mountainside at him and arranged for a mad elephant to be let loose in the road at the time the road was collecting all. So it's kind of famous story. So in the second city, the Buddha used, it was kind of a mediation of sorts that he was trying to do with these disgruntled monks. And it was known, I have to pause to read it, but this is a long Sanskrit word, adhikara nasama, which means covering over with grass. And this is where there's an agreement to leave past transgressions and begin new. It didn't work. And the Buddha abandoned the researches. So how harmonious is all that? Over the years, in our lineage, precepts, our ethical guidelines, were developed. And having, this was out of necessity, but having all those monks and nuns living together in community. So through trial and error, they were established. The number of precepts, they vary by tradition. The Theravada had five precepts. Later, the Mahayana, in the Mahayana tradition, the monks had 250. Mahayana nuns had 348. All these precepts, these guidelines, this idea that I go to the bathroom, I eat, it just the list goes on and on. Um, one of the, the precepts for the Mahayana nuns that I love was avoid engaging in seductive magic. <laughs> and there was even another one about limiting the height of the bed for the nuns. It could only be six inches or less. That's one of those nasty ones from when you were there. So in our tradition, we now have 16 bodhisattva precepts that were developed from yogis. So, those of you that know Sensei Daishin, who was at the Northern Sensei Association for many years, he often spoke of living in community, being like a rock tunnel, sharp edges being smooth and polished over time. We have our atonement ceremonies, which date back to the Buddha's time, where we bring ourselves back into alignment with the precepts. And still, the human condition lives on in our modern societies in the form of intermittent scandals and conflicts. And we bear witness to all of this. In our Sangha at BCLA, we have developed what's called Sangha Sutra under Roshi Giri Giri Titi's guidance. And this document includes statements of right conduct, conflict resolution and grievance procedures, and a statement of ethics for ZCLI future. And many Sanghas are doing likewise. And this is our necessity. An important, an important point that I just want to quickly bring up here before when we look at these Bodhisattva precepts, and one in particular, the one that says, I will unconditionally accept what each moment has to offer. This is the practice of not talking about others' errors and faults. I will acknowledge responsibility for everything in my life. So this does not mean that you don't call out a wrong that is harming the community, that is harming the song. And I think that's been part of the equation with a number of the sanghas, in a number of the sanghas, and the scandals that have gone on that are unconvenient. There's a story from the Pali 
Sutta, which is pretty well known, that goes, Venerable Ananda went to the Blessed One. And on arrival, having bowed down to the Blessed One, sat to one side. As he was sitting there, Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, This is half of the holy life. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie. Don't say that, Ananda. Most prudent response. Don't say that. Admirable friendship, admirable companionship, admirable camaraderie is actually the whole of the whole life. When a monk has admirable people as friends, companions, and com uh, comrades, he can be expected to develop and pursue the noble eightfold path. That's the Dogen way. We take refuge in the Buddha because the Buddha is our great teacher. We take refuge in the Dharma because the Dharma is good medicine. And we take refuge in the Sangha because the people of the Sangha are excellent friends for us. And I think back and I realized that I could not have done this practice on my own. I practice over these years with the help of my teachers, with my Dharma brothers and sisters, and with the help that you all are Those of you on Zoom, and those of you not on Zoom, they're part of our son. And I like to do this, it's like exercise. It's so much easier going to a class where you have others around to support you. That's why I do Qigong with Koshi. That's why I've done yoga classes with teachers for years and years, just having that support. It's tough to do it. I have the self-discipline to do this all on my own. And I have made endearing friendships throughout these years in both these songs. And actually, some of the closest relationships I have in my own life have come out of this spiritual journey. Uh, I think of uh, Sensei Rikimo. So incremental on my own spiritual journey. And I can't forget that the young girl who I spent 22 years with her dad who's still there. So along the way, I feel that I've learned patience. I began with Teddy and Tikman Han, and I'll end with just a few lines again from. We can prepare the ground for bringing the Buddha to life for our sake and the sake of countless others by transforming our own suffering and cultivating the art of Swami Jinn. It is the most important work we can do. And we do now a little time if there are any comments. Questions, feel free. You can use if you're on Zoom the raise hand function and push in and uh, can let you speak. We'll take a few moments. Go ahead, Kanjo, can you unmute? Or... Yeah, can y'all hear me okay? Um, pretty low volume. 
Right. Microphones, does this help? A little better, yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, reflect on how much I uh, appreciate the, um, the element of, uh, you know, how much easier it is to practice with others. Um, speaker's not working. So. Can you hear me? Okay. okay, I think it took that time. Kanye, would you say a few words? Can you hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Yeah, so I, I just, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to reflect on what you were just uh, talking about a few moments ago about how much easier it is to practice together and about um, something you mentioned in particular earlier in, in your talk about, um, you know, uh, taking road trips down to the center in LA um, to attend Sasenkais and Sessions and um, I made it one of my habits to try to drag somebody down with me. And I guess it um, <laughs> it became such a regular thing that I think Udo mentioned it in my host. Said. <laughs> well, he would know seeing as uh, he was always the first face that we saw when we came through the gate. Who'd you bring this time? Who's this knucklehead? But um, <clears throat> yeah, um, and that's the, that story about, um, you know, good friendship and good good camaraderie or good comrades being the whole of, of the, the path is something that actually that Koshin and I have talked about on a few occasions. Um, you know, Koshin being one of the many people in our, our Sangha that I really appreciate being able to spend time with. And um, it really does make um, the biggest difference for me. I used to, to sit um, before I came to your sitting group I think it's 11 years ago, um, and I probably would not have continued uh, if not for the encouragement and the expectation, <laughs> ultimately, uh, of showing up and being expected. Um, and uh, it's it's been wonderful, and and I appreciate you know those that encouraged you and that you you know took their their suggestion and started the, the group because the, the Sangha has made a big big difference in my life. So I appreciate this topic. Yeah, the other thing that came up in mind too is just that this is as important as Sangha is on the three jewels. Uh, it's because it's kind of, that's where the relationships happen. There's the Buddha, of course, and the Buddha nature. And uh, the awakening though that we talk about, you can't sit on the top of the pole. Get about life, go on with life, and attend Oxford pictures. The, uh, the last picture, of course, is the Buddha coming down, back down to the Hopkins place. And this is really where it happened. And, and the Sutra are wonderful teachings, but it's really in relationships. And I, I feel like in those relationships, often what I what I see is that we in spending time together, reflect each other's, you know, sort of best, best aspects um, back at each other. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, John, would you like to unmute? Sure, can you guys hear me okay? I'm, yeah. using, I'm using this microphone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I uh, for, for that for that last bit of, of the Dharma talk when I had my when I had my uh, my, my camera off I, I, I didn't catch that because I was trying to trying to connect this microphone and I didn't know how to do it but anyway uh, I I did catch most of it and um, yeah um, I'm I'm very grateful for this topic because like um, and I'm very grateful for the Sangha you know uh, I, I'm 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 especially grateful because like uh, for for the for the Zoom aspect because um, uh, like I live in Templeton and it's and it's hard for me to uh, get to Crow's End or especially to uh, uh, I've I've never been to um, White Heron Sangha where you guys are at right now and uh, it's uh, 
it's a great boon for me to be able to to be able to participate with you guys on Zoom, and um, you know, I've 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 forged friendships in this song. Uh, Koshin, Koshin, and uh, Hoetsu. Uh, Hoetsu has been to my house multiple times. Koshin has been to my house once, uh, and we we've hung out and we've talked. And uh, you know, uh, Hoetsu even sat with me at one point. And that was that was amazing. Um, and you know, just the 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 friendships that I forge in here is something that I I would that I don't take for granted, you know. Um, and I'm and I'm grateful for our for for our uh, uh, for our face to faces, Sensei. And and uh, it's it's a lot a lot of the advice that you've given me. Well, most of the advice that you've given me is has been extremely helpful. And even this even the stuff that that hasn't been so much is is has has been has been enriching and fulfilling for me you know um and you know it's it, yeah and and you know um it's it I'm, I'm just extremely grateful for for all of this you know um like 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 uh uh, Koshin, like like Kanjo and I have talked about, we we've 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 spoken about the the whole uh, friendship is the path thing, and uh, it's I, I I wholeheartedly agree with that. You know um, that 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 um, um, noble friends, uh, the the friends that you forge in the sangha are are like bonds, ties ties that bind. You know. And I like what you said about how how sangha is is uh is is like what what was it it was a uh, it was a uh uh bound uh, it was it was a uh, it was str um strung together uh I, I couldn't I couldn't catch it struck together struck together okay <laughs> yeah uh. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's it's a uh, it, it for me that that brings up like uh, like like a sword, you know, uh, the folds the folds and the sword being struck together to make to make a to make a stronger to make to, to make a stronger bond and to and to and to really really uh, solidify like like when when you're making a when you're making a uh, 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 when you're making a katana, you know, it's, it's hundreds of folds, you know, and, and it's the same with the sangha, you know, it's like hundreds of folds that make a, make a stronger, make a stronger sword. Uh, and, and this sword cuts through, cuts through delusions and, and, and uh, helps, helps in practice. And it's, it's the whole practice is the sangha. Uh, and I'm, I'm just very, very floored with gratitude. Um, thank you. Yeah, the Zoom environment, I think, has been wonderful. Um, thank you, Reverend Dharma Joy, for everything you've done throughout this uh, pandemic. Now, the ZCLA has been incredible. Uh, I happen to love service, so I am there religiously. Uh, after we have our little 6 a.m. to 7 a.m a um, set that I immediately go Wednesday through Friday and zoom down to the ZCLA so I can participate with others with the sangha in service. And it's much easier to do, do it that way than uh, big solo, which is kind of has been the norm for years and years. But it's nice to have uh, the sangha participating and doing this together. So, Reverend Dharma Joy, thank you so much. But then I questioned, why are you here? Isn't there a big program at UCLA? <laughs> and with that, you can take it away, Reverend Dharma Joy. <laughs> oh, uh, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I can hear everyone. I have my sound up. Uh, I'll just say I'm a bad person because I did multitask at the beginning of this, and there's going to be a new Bluetooth microphone showing up at your house uh, Sensei Shogun before the end of the week to help with sound for next time so I can uh, do some tech support remotely. So uh, obviously this is a, a matter dear, near and dear to my heart. 
Um, and I think probably every generation of practitioners has this exact same, you know, situation. Uh, right now, one of the things I'm studying or trying to get around to studying is just, um, you know, we have these ideas about what the Sangha looked like historically, and you, you touched upon it in your, uh, in your um, quotation from the Shobogenzo Zui Monkey. You know, we have these ideas, the golden age of Zen was not, I mean, sure, there were monasteries with hundreds of people, and we have those now, you know, but that's not the norm. And, you know, as, as you were reading this just idea that just six or eight people practicing together diligently, you know, that was the golden age of Zen. And you talked about the schism, you know, in the in Shakyamuni Buddha's time, but the thing I'm looking at right now is, um, well, just thinking about like when Dogen Zenji comes back from China and writes the, um, you know, uh, the, um, well, when he first comes back, he, he's, he's basically alone. You know, he writes the Fukan Zazengi. The, the point of the Fukan Zazengi was to tell people they should be sitting in meditation because nobody was doing it. That wasn't what they were doing. And so he then goes off and he has all sorts of people who are trying to undercut him. So he ends up leaving Kyoto to go found someplace a long way away in the mountains where he can kind of get some stuff going, but there's very little, you know, there's very little going on. And, and, you know, we talk about uh, Keizan Jokin, you know, the, the mother of the Soto school. Um, Keizan Jokin was never the abbot of Eiheiji because his teacher, there was a schism there and his teacher Tetsugikai was thrown out of Eiheiji. He was basically forced to live in the entry gate in the little the little house at the entry gate for years and then he was thrown out of there and he ended up going off and founding his own temple just pretty much alone and so Keizan Jokin you know who we think of as this giant figure you know had very few followers and so we get these ideas about what's you know a good Zen Sangha but we have to you know it's all you know if you look at it historically we are in the same place we were a thousand years ago. <laughs> and it's all exactly the same. I mean, when you, what you, I'll just go through a few of the things. Sensei Dokai, you know, Sensei Dokai, her favorite phrase or favorite word is the Kalyana Mitra, which is the noble, the spiritual friend, the noble friend you're talking about. She likes the Pali term, but the Kalyana Mitra, that's what we are together with each other. And uh, I remember Sensei Shingetsu, she said to me all those things she said to you, I was never interested in starting a group. And I, luckily I live so close. But, you know, she said she would, she had, she would go, she would have sitting groups in her, in her house. And there were many weeks where she just sat alone. And she went to Maizu Miroshi and was in kind of despair about that. And he just encouraged her, as you were saying, like she would just sit alone and no one would show up. And, but this was her offering, you know, and to think that, oh, because there aren't other people here, I shouldn't be sitting, I shouldn't be making this offering. It's not, it's not, that's not our vow, you know, that to really connect with the vow is so powerful and really keeps us going. And that's why, you know, Roshi Agyoku, for those of you who see her in talks or see her, you know, her favorite phrase has become, just keep going, let's just keep going. And we just keep going. And, you know, even at CCLA, you know, for the last this year and this, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had 50, 60 people in our Thursday night talks via Zoom. But now we have fewer than 20. So, yeah, as someone who's now one of the three seats as the leaders of CCLA, I think, you know, what's the future look like? And it can be moments of anxiety and not despair, but anxiety for sure. And, you know, as, as Sensei Shogun certainly knows, you know, Mayazumi Roshi, his last words in his Inca poem to Bernie Glassman, do not let die the wisdom seed of the Buddhas. You know, Truly, I implore you. So this is what we take on, 
in this practice. And as you become more involved in it, this is, it's our, it's our, it's our vow to carry it forward. What that may look like, I don't know. This is America. It's a different world. What, it, how we do it, we're still making it up. But at the, certainly there's no question that, you know, the practice is the teaching and transmission of the Dharma, whatever that is, from one person to another. And we do that in Sangha life. And we can think of it as the formal Sangha, the formal Dharma and all of that, a Dharma talk and a koan and all of that. But it's also this practice of just practicing together. Some of the favorite koans are koans where there are two brothers, unfortunately, they're always brothers, but you know, two practitioners, two students, you know, sort of basically egging each other on in a little, you know, in a little kind of Dharma combat of their own. And it's always, of course, encouraging. It's never discouraging. It's always, we're always trying to lift each other up. And that's what Sangha practice is. And, you know, the wonderful thing about Zoom is we can now do it. You know, here I am in Hollywood and you are, you know, Templeton and, and San Luis Obispo and all these wonderful places. But it it is, you know, there's, well, we just keep going. <laughs> Thank you all so much. And we are in training, so we're going to try for another formal exit. So, if I may, I just would like to add a couple words of my own. I'm coaching. Um, just how much I appreciate the Sangha and, and just uh, landing here. A happy accident. How did I get so lucky? Right? Like, or, you know, you end the affiliation with the Zen Center in Los Angeles, you know, the things that I've learned from that Sangha there. And the one thing I'd mention, what's coming up for me a lot these days is the term, the currency of inconvenience is how we live our lives, what we really pay, what it costs to be a person in, in this world is often associated with money, but it's really more in my experience, the inconvenience that we're really paying and investing. And so the inconvenience, schlepping the gear, it's greatly appreciated. You know, in your example of the inconvenience of driving to Los Angeles every weekend for 20 years, it, it's not a money thing. It's, it's an investment that I feel like I'm reaping. Anyway, thanks. Um, in that case, I completely lost it. Um, so the four vows. Oh, yeah. On the platform. Okay. Numberless beings, I vow to serve them. Inexhaustible illusions, I vow to them boundless dharmas, I vow to practice them unsurpassable joy, I vow to embody it numberless beings, I vow to serve them. Inexhaustible delusions, I vow to end them. Boundless dharmas, I vow to practice them. Unsurpassable Buddha way, I vow to embody it. Should I switch the camera back or is it? No, it's not. I hold that shit. It'll be in a different place to move the chair.
your web hosting. Thank you all so very much. That's a wrap. Take care. Thank you, Sensei, for this song. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you. <laughs>